Hey, this is Randy Hetrick, founder of TRX, and you're listening to the Heart Healthy Hustle Show. Hello, and welcome back to another inspiring episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle Show. Today, we are joined with a special guest, Randy Hetrick. Randy Hetrick is the founder and co-chairman of TRX, one of the world's leading brands in health and fitness. If you've ever been inside of a gym, a wellness center, even a physical therapy clinic, you've probably seen these suspension bands. They are, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they are usually bright yellow with uh, black contrast and some dark gray in the color scheme. Is that correct? Usually, well, black with yellow accents, but yeah, black and yellow is our, is our sort of whole theme. Staple colors. I can pretty much see them anytime I go to a gym. It's a good, it's a sign of a good gym typically. Okay. So you're going to see them in only the best. So prior to founding TRX, Randy actually spent 14 years as a commando in the U.S. Navy SEAL teams with an operational career that culminated as a squadron commander of the SEALs Elite Special Missions Unit. Subsequent to his service as a SEAL, he earned an MBA from Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. Randy's formal entrepreneurial career began in his garage, transforming the crude invention of necessity he had created in the field into the TRX suspension trainer that we all know, love, and use today. So in addition to his role as co-chairman of TRX, Randy is also an investor and advisor to early stage businesses He's a unique speaker to organizations around the world and a regular lecturer on leadership and entrepreneurship at his alma maters, USC and Stanford. And he's currently working on his first book, A Survival Guide for Entrepreneurs. So, uh, so Randy, just love to delve right into, you know, a little bit about your day, how things are going for you, spark up some conversation prior to getting into the nitty gritty. Well, pretty good. You know, I woke up this morning, I actually did an Instagram post, which, uh, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do more of. Uh, fortunately, I got my my guys that helped me with uh, getting stuff up on our social channels. But this morning, I woke up and I had Joker hair. I had quarantine <laughs> day forty seven, right? Which which when I first wake up, it it is like a bad version of an afro, uh, and and I so I've slicked it down just for you. And you know, sitting here in Mill Valley, though. It's uh, it's a beautiful sunny day, and all things considered, would I rather be without the quarantine? Absolutely, but it ain't a half bad uh, place to be despite the quarantine. So I'm doing pretty well. How about you? I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm going well here on the East Coast. Uh, how's that book coming? Uh, not as well as I had hoped in terms of progress. I think it's uh, it's you know it's going to be a really interesting book when I get it done. Um, COVID-19 should be helping, but somehow it seems like my, you know, my, my 16 hour work days these days with the, the great boundaryless workplace, right. That we're all in, uh, yeah. is thwarting me, but you know, I think it's going to be a really, a really useful, uh, addition to what's out there because one of the things that I've noticed and the reason that, that I was inspired to write the book is that you know, I went to one of the best business schools in the world um, struggled my way through that and, and graduated with, you know, a bunch of knowledge that is great. Once you're sort of, I don't know, 10,000 feet or so above ground, you know, you're either, I mean, most business schools are really designed to prepare mid-level leaders at larger companies, right? And even comp, even the schools that have an entrepreneurial emphasis tend to start too high. That's what I've, that's what I've discovered. Right. And, and the day that you graduate, as I did back in, you know, uh, mid 2003, you go walking out the door to become an entrepreneur and you're immediately hit by just this mountain of things that you don't know answers to, and that you didn't learn in your highfalutin business school that you just got out of, right. By no fault of their own. Mostly they bring in lecturers that are, mm. you know, uh, retired, or, or nearly retired senior execs. They have professors that know an awful lot about, about, you know, sort of frameworks and structures and analytical lenses, but, but those cats never started something. And so you end up with this, with this basically this airspace below 10,000 feet all the way down to weed level that you need for the first five to 10 years as an entrepreneur and nobody's given it to you. And so that's what my, uh, what my book is going to aim to address. I, I'm, I'm, I'm loosely calling it what to expect when you don't expect it. Uh, like you know, it. an entrepreneur survival yeah, guide. Yeah. Love that. Love that. That's really, really cool. And especially coming from you having 
graduated from. I researched you quite a bit, Randy, and I noticed that uh, you were serving, you know, in the SEALs prior to attending Stanford. Is that right? Yeah, I, I was the granddaddy of my class at Stanford by about six years, unbelievably. I remember that the, the modal age was 26 and a half and the mm. mean was 28 because of me out on the end of the teeter-totter, <laughs> right? Pulling up all the kids, you know, to a higher average, but not higher GPA, mind you. That was not my job. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was, uh, I was a SEAL for 14 years and then uh, decided to uh, go to Stanford after that to try to learn business. Was that due to, uh, you know, having discovered that you had a great idea and it was viable? Is that what drove you to want to go to Stanford? What was it that motivated that? No, you know, actually it's funny because when I decided to go into the teams, I thought I was going to go in for four years you know, work okay. my butt off, get a deployment or two with a SEAL platoon, and then go back to business school at Stanford, right? That was my goal. And um, I just kept getting amazing opportunities one after another. And I ended up staying 14 years. And the only reason that I left then was because uh, my wife was pregnant and, you know, was completely done with the superhero gone nine months a year lifestyle. Mm. And I was promoting out of the field. You know, I had made it to the peak of, of the mountain in terms of the things that I really um, valued, which was operational leadership opportunities in the field. And I was promoting out of the field as my next, my next role. So I made the decision that I would uh, try to reapply to Stanford because I had applied a couple years earlier and gotten turned down. Sure. And I decided to reapply. And, you know, to my everlasting astonishment, they decided that was the year for a, uh, to have a seal in the recruiting poster. That's fantastic. Uh, when you did get the news that you were accepted, how did it feel? Were you pretty much ready to go? Like it's about time or were you, were you surprised? I was shocked. I mean, I was so shocked. I never actually thought I was going to have to deliver on that deal. It was kind of a deal to, you know, a bargain with my gal that, you know, I essentially said, you know, well, wait a minute. Cause she had a big promotion to the West coast at the time and was essentially said, you know, uh, I'm moving and you're welcome to come along, you know, make the right decision. <laughs> and I, I, I cut a deal that I never actually thought I would have to uh, deliver on, but you know, you never know what life's about to bring you. So, uh, mm. so I, I stepped up and resigned my commission and went out to get punished uh, at Stanford. <laughs> So now we're about, is that about six years back? Was that? I wish that was back in, uh, 2001, uh, end of oh, 2001 wow. was when I, uh, I had my change command of the squadron in uh, July of 2001 and started math camp at Stanford in August. Wow. Man, that's intense. Yeah, you, Can you you're probably still in grade school back then, right? Oh, barely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was born in 91. So I would have been uh, sure. No, you no need to be no need to be a bully here. <laughs> no, but uh, it's it's great to hear this, man. I got to tell you because you are the first. Uh, I've interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, we had uh, Jason Kalipo of NC Fit on last week. Um, actually, Aaron Marino, who does a lot of affiliate stuff, and so he's built a couple of cool businesses with like men's skincare and some other things. Um, and I've never interviewed anybody who's actually done you know, the pedigree, so to speak, that you have with having served in the SEALs and, on, and then going to Stanford as well. So I'm very excited to, you know, get into like what your motivations are and a little bit more on your background, uh, kind of starting from the earlier days. Can you share with us, um, before we go any further, can you share with us a favorite motto or uh, saying that maybe you live by and what it means to you? Oh man. Well, the, probably the biggest one is that I I've always loved for some reason, I, I found it before I went into buds when I was really, you know, back when I was a kid searching for how I was going to define myself. And I stumbled upon this, this famous old quote by Henry Ford, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're probably right. And okay. that, mm -hmm. that one has, has defined me, frankly, and just about all of the hard headed stuff that I've taken on. And I have it on my desk at, uh, at work. Now I'm not there right now, but, uh, but I have it on my desk at work and I look at it every single day and it always reminds me of just one of those basic truths in life. Yeah. Belief, the importance of belief. Yep. That's huge. 
one of the things I have heard you say in multiple interviews where you share the full story of TRX is, you know, the mojo of entrepreneurship really is that optimism mixed with the unforeseen anticipate, anticipatory uh, wins around the corner, those wins that are around the corner. Can you talk a bit about how to protect that, how to foster that, and how to really kind of keep that cup pretty full so you can take the sips when needed? Yeah, I mean, it, it really is one of these funny things that, that any entrepreneur who's been around a while will tell you whether they kind of have thought of it this way or not. But there is this, this, uh, this inner, I don't know what to call it. It's like a reservoir of juice, right? And, mm, and I call yeah. it mojo. And it, it really is that, that the fuel that allows an entrepreneur to remain optimistic. And to, you know, to wake up and say, all right, well, <clears throat> this thing that's visiting me today, I may not have asked for, but, you know, I'm going to power through it. And, and no matter how dark, because entrepreneurship can be a dark place at times, right? It's, it's, it's not a, if you want a nice, steady, certain path, go to work in a big corporation. And, and because entrepreneurial paths are not that way, they tend to be full of twists and turns and bumps and potholes and vines that, you know, rip your <laughs> eyes out if you're not careful. And, and yet, you know, the, the best entrepreneurs figure out how every single day to, to get their mind right, as my good buddy Todd Durkin likes to say, and, and to really stay focused on that opportunity that's coming just around the next corner. And they always are, right? And sometimes it takes a little, further, a little longer to get around the corner than you thought but they're always there and that mojo is really critical. And so you gotta be careful about how you allow people and, and events to, to leak that mojo out the bottom of the tank. If you're not careful, right, you wake up. And that ultimately is I think what kills most entrepreneurial ventures is that the, the guys or gals that are running them, they, they just run out of juice, you know, mm -hmm. and they decide, ah, hell with it, I'll go get a job, right? Doing something, uh, doing something more normal. And so that mojo, you got to hang on to, and there's, you know, we can talk about different ways that, that, you know, that I manage it. Yeah. Let's jump, let's jump right into that. What are, what are some of the ways that you manage it? I, I, and, and on the vein of Henry Ford, actually on my desk right here, which is holding my 2020 vision board, I have, it's a picture from another entrepreneur company. They, uh, it's a supplement company, but they sent out these little cards with like, uh, an old picture from an old entrepreneur back in the day. And this one was Henry Ford. And he said, uh, uh, I think it says a vision. Yeah, vision, without vision, vision without execution is just a hallucination. Oh, so, I like that one. I haven't heard it. I haven't heard it, it, but I like it. I, I want to get from you, you know, somebody who's done it. You, you, you know, you've achieved the American dream, as they say. And you, you have the company. You have the idea. You defended the idea. You went to battle for it. You went to battle in real life. I mean, you've, you've done it. You know what I mean? You have it, in, in, you, you have it under the belt. And um, in pretty much every category. So I want to get from you, you know, what are, what, what are the keys to um, people listening to this show are not just thinking about starting up like their e-commerce thing. They're actually, you know, running businesses, they're doing things. Um, usually they're like, I, like I shared with you before the show, uh, you know, I want to get from you though, somebody who's where you are right now, what are, what are the ways that you think about execution? What, how do you, how do you see that? It, it, obviously not optional, um, but I'm wondering, you know, is that, does that play into, you know, that mojo and how do you, uh, how do you view execution in, in your business? Well, first of all, I want to, I want to say, look, the, the things that I did in the SEAL teams, um, you know, was an incredible privilege and, and I was surrounded by some of the most amazing guys that, that, you know, have ever walked the face of the earth in terms of capability and execution capability. And the stuff that went on in my career was nothing compared to the stuff that the guys that came, you know, some of my young guys, when I was a squadron commander, the things they went on to do over the next 12 years, 13, 15 years were unbelievable and, and way beyond anything that I experienced in my career. But I had this, this real luxury to work with some of the very best uh, most dedicated, capable human beings that you could ever imagine in right. the SEAL teams. And that was a bit of a transition for me when I, when I moved on into the civilian world because that same level of commitment and, you know, will not fail 
sort of drive I have found to be in shorter supply out in the civilian world than it was in the teams, as you might expect. And so, you know, I, I've learned, I learned a lot during that transition about how to set goals and, and not project one's own, uh, you know, priorities and, and capabilities and drive on other people, because it, it, oftentimes that's a recipe for disappointment. Uh, you got to find ways to, you know, bring your group, uh, you got to find ways to bring your group around, uh, a common goal that they all share and then figure out how to motivate people on their terms, right? And not just on your own terms. So that's the first thing I would say about execution is that it's all about the team and teams differ, right? Individuals uh, have different things that they find, uh, inspirational, and they have different levels of, of commitment that they're willing to deploy. And as a leader in a, you know, in an organization, in the civilian world, you have to, you really have to become a bit of an artist on figuring out how to tease out those points of inspiration and motivation from each of your team members. If you want to execute mm. well as a unit. Speaking of teams, how do you find, uh, you know, trustworthy people who are uh, capable as well? Well, I mean, hey, if I if I had the answer to that, man, I would write a book that would uh, sell, you know, a, a gazillion copies. I think that the 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 best way that I figured how to do it, and I've had a pretty unique circumstance. And when I unique, I don't mean in a good way, being headquartered in San Francisco, because being a small non-tech company, right, in the epicenter of the tech giant universe is challenging and and so what you have to do is find ways to uh basically find find things back to my pre previous point find ways to attract people that don't necessarily purely involve money right you have to speak to them in in other ways and so part of finding a good per a, a really good team member to your point is not only you know spending plenty of time on, on the interviewing process, making sure that you really understand the person, doing all of your, all of your reference checks, not just the references that a person gives you, but you know, beating the bushes till you find references from those people that can talk to you about the candidate. But more important than all of that, I think, is figuring out if the person has integrity, accountability, and a passion for your venture, for your area. You know, in my case, it's finding if I need a great marketer, it's finding somebody who not only has those marketing skills and the kind of the formative career path that, that gave them those skills, but it's finding somebody who really understands and cares about fitness, sports, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. athletic training, because those people are then committed to the mission and they want to stick around even when they get an offer from Salesforce or yeah, Facebook yeah. or Apple, right? They don't want to go because they want to do, they want to be there doing the staff class every day yeah. at one o'clock in our training center. They want to be around athletes. They want to be helping people. So you know what I mean? It's more, it's more than just the skills, frankly. It's, it's as much the mindset and commitment as it is the skill set. I can get somebody skills. What I can't do is make them a great person or make them passionate about my business. Mm. Mm. And just as like a summary, I, I again, I want to make the most of this time. And I know that you've done many amazing interviews. Uh, how I built this with Guy Raz is one that comes to mind on how you built TRX and the full journey, uh, you know, but if we could, I'd li like to hear almost like a, if you if, if you can almost like a summer a summary version, brief story of how you started it. Uh, and, and a little bit of those initial trials that you had to overcome. Um, obviously, I, I, I was watching. Uh, well, not obvious, but Guy Raz, I was watching an interview with him on, um, I think it was, uh, what's his name? Not Jimmy Kimmel, the other guy. And he was talking to him and he's like, what's one of the common themes? He was asking Guy of all these successful entrepreneurs who are, you know, doing phenomenal. And he said their ability to bulldoze rejection, to just, it's, it doesn't phase them. If you can do that, you, can, you have the capacity to become, uh, you know, a, a viable entrepreneur in the long game. Um, but can you take us back to that initial, uh, you know, that initial jujitsu belt when you were out, when you were deployed, can you take us back to that scene? Yeah, I, I mean, during the nineties, we were deploying a lot and, um, 
frankly, more often than not, we would deploy into a theater and then, you know, nothing would happen uh, because the politicians liked to practice what I call deterrence through deployment. If somebody was doing something crappy in the world, right, they wanted to stop, they would deploy in, you know, one of the top tier units and you get there and within a couple of days, the locals have figured out that you're there and the word spreads that there's, you know, big wow. gnarly guys down in that hidden in that warehouse with a bunch of guns <laughs> and, and the bad guys go away. And, and it's actually a pretty effective technique because what it did was, you know, it's the ultimate definition of diplomacy. You got your will uh, enacted without having to, you know, having to commit violence. And so while it, while it was frustrating for, for the commandos who were there to, you know, do the nation's bidding, uh, it was actually a pretty effective political strategy. The challenge, Challenges that we would deploy into places with no gym gear to stay in shape and you know special ops Operators are, are mostly like pro athletes just wearing a different kind of uniform mm. So imagine trying to stay in world-class <laughs> condition with you know the same the same tools that the Romans had right you push up yeah. sit-ups, you know uh, throwing each other around and I was on one of those uh, a, a workup for uh, a a mission where you basically take a freighter that's that's been uh, hijacked and you reclaim it and i was trying to figure out how to how to climb a caving ladder up the side of a ship with a bunch of gear on my back and how to train for that and by coincidence i had accidentally scooped up as i was loading out my gear i'd scooped up my jiu-jitsu belt you know that was sitting underneath a flight suit and as i stuffed it in my bag i didn't realize it but then I ended up over, over in Asia, sitting on a cot, staring at, you know, this, all this stuff that I'd pulled out of my bags. And among it was a, was a jujitsu belt, which was not, uh, not super useful. Actually, I can, I can run and grab it for you here in a minute yeah. if you want to see yeah. it. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Sitting in the other room. Yeah. So I'll just, just cue me when you want me to go get it. But I, uh, I, um, I ended up staring at this bathroom door, ironically, and thinking to myself, now, wait a minute, what if, you know, I had a lot of experience as a wrestler climbing ropes. Mm -hmm. So I, so I understood how to use body weight as a resistive force. And I went over and tied a knot in the jujitsu belt, threw it over the door and leaned back. And the first move that ever, that ever happened on a suspension trainer, uh, we now today call the power pull, which is basically like reaching up for, for a ladder, right? Pulling yourself up. And then if you could lower yourself down and pull yourself back up against gravity, right, you would train that movement. That's what we call functional training, training a movement that you need to perform in life. And, uh, and I leaned back against the jujitsu belt, lifted myself up that way. And I thought, man, that's kind of cool. And just started messing around. And pretty soon I had stitched together this harness with a little bit of, of the webbing that we use to repair parachutes and that jujitsu belt. And it basically looked like a crude version of today's TRX, right? An upside down Y. And um, I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever suffered under the straps yourself, but it's, yeah. uh, it's, pre it's pretty astonishing what yeah. you can do with just your body weight, right? Yeah. Working against gravity. If you kind of understand the moves and how to load the moves and how to unload the moves, right? Cause not everything is better by making it harder. That's, <laughs> that's something I've learned in life as well. Um, but yeah, so that, that was the beginning and it just kind of got popular with the guys in my squadron and I they busted away. your balls first, right? They, they, well, of course they always <laughs> do, right? That's, that's, that's sort of part of uh, the same credo in the SEAL teams as you'll find in any, in any sports team, right? It's like the first thing that guys like to do to each other is heckle. And then shortly thereafter, you know, then they, they're like, all right, get out of the way. Let me see this thing. Let me, right, let me right, show right, you. Right. I got an idea. <laughs> I did enough pushups today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's and that's pretty much exactly how it exactly how it went. And uh, so when I when I left the teams, I I didn't plan to to form a business. I thought I was going to go to business school and then probably go to work at a big big organization because I had a lot of experience at that point, you know, um, uh, leading. And mm -hmm. I it really didn't even occur to me that I would do this this tiny little startup. That would have been sort of nutty, uh, but you know, as I said, life's path winds in uh, strange and wonderful ways. Can you, can you grab the uh, belt now? I, I got yeah, you so curious sure. to see it. So here she is. So in the middle of it is uh, six feet of nylon uh -huh. webbing with a 
with a basic issue carabiner on the end of it and the original door the original door anchor don't try that at home you'll crush that out of the door frame so <laughs> i managed to crush door frames you know uh, at, at a number of hotels before I evolved this original model, but that's it. That's the original, uh, the original strap right there, man. Patient wow. zero. Where's the initial handles? Did you just grab the actual straps? Oh, there were no handles. Yeah, no handles. No, that, that was the great thing, right? It was fully adjustable. You grabbed high, you grabbed low. And, and, uh, <laughs> that's an entrepreneurial and, definition of uh, attribute fully adjustable <laughs> fully adjustable wherever you grab it, it it is right and and no the idea with it originally was that was part of the benefit right you, mm -hmm. you'd hang on to the strap and that would that would increase your grip strength as well but then you know i i, I figured out that 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 is a level of commitment above what most people want most people just want to grab some handles and you know that are ergonomically sort of designed mm -hmm. rather than grab hold of something that's ripping at your hands and even though it's making you stronger it's not that pleasant so one of the first mm -hmm. uh one of the first innovations that i actually did on the next version of this strap was to take mm -hmm. the end and create a loop right and then that became uh something you could put your hand through or your foot right and and uh and we were off to the races Hmm. That's one of the things I love about this, the whole, the whole training system is that it can be incorporated into like a full body. It doesn't have to just be rows. It doesn't just have to be a, whatever it is. It can be multiple things. You could be doing abs. You can be doing stabilizer work. You can use them as like an augmentative assist while you do a pistol squat. You can do all different types of stuff. It's been pretty cool because it, it, it was beyond what I originally envisioned, right? It, it's, uh, it's become something different to everyone. And, mm -hmm. and that, uh, that's been pretty powerful. Who knew this thing was going to become one of the most popular senior fitness tools like mm -hmm. that? I thought it was, a, I thought this was a commando tool, man. I didn't, I didn't envision silver sneakers folks on it, but I'm yeah. sure happy to have them. So that, that brings me to a really interesting question, which is you mentioned, oh, people didn't actually, turns out they didn't really enjoy having their hands ground up in the strap. They wanted a comfortable handle with foam and now rubber, whatever it is. Um, but was that hard for you as, or were you just like, all right, pivot, this is what people want. We're going to do that. Even though you'll get stronger from this, was that hard for you? Or is that just no, no question do it? You know, I think that, I think you got to listen to your customers and pretty early on, you know, we got a lot of feedback from folks that had good ideas and we're like, Hey, you know, what if you did this? What if you tried this? And, uh, fortunately for me, I mean, the SEAL teams are an incredibly nimble and, and rapid pivot kind of culture. So when you, you know, you could have a whole plan for an operation, yeah. but, but, you know, the first moment that, that the op is underway, you're, you're served up by something that you didn't expect and you have to pivot to, you know, either a pre-planned secondary uh, course of action, or you have to adapt on, on the fly. And so I was pretty, you know, to me, it was all about creating an eclectic system that that was the best of everything right if whether it was a technique or a feature or a philosophy right if it if it made sense and was uh validated by both practice and science we were going to adopt it and so uh so that's what we did boom so after you, you you shared that initial kind of happening of this what was the aha moment where you made a decision to pursue this and make it into a business well you know i had I used the I used the summer between my first and second year at business school. Um, well, actually, if I go back just a little before that, what what the aha moment was 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 another buddy and I when, in our first year at Stanford would go out to the weight room, the athlete training center, and we'd gotten permission okay. to train out there because, you know, uh, basically I was an old commando. He'd been a he'd been a, a football player on the team and uh, got us permission out there to go out and train and. And during the first, I don't know, three or four months, uh, just about every single coach at Stanford would be in there with their squad, right, working out during their appointed hour. Right. And they'd end up wandering over and saying to me, like, dude, what is this, right? And they would always, also always ask, like, why are you so old, right? Everybody else in here is like 18. And I was 36, <laughs> right? I was so old, 36. And, um, but I was pretty chiseled because any excuse – to do something other than study, right? So I, so I was getting plenty of workouts and, uh, and I would end up explaining, oh, well, here's what it is. Here's where I came from. Here's what I developed it for. And 10 minutes later, they'd be, 
they'd be asking me, first of all, to make a bunch of them for their team. And I'd say, well, I don't, you know, I'm not really in production yet. And, and then they'd be telling me all the reasons that this was perfect for their athlete. And their athletes went from 300 pound male linemen to 90 pound female sprinters, mm. right? And, and everywhere mm. in between. All and, different types so, of teams. All different types of skills, you know, genders, sizes. And I kept hearing it over and over from people who know coaches, right? Who make their living uh, making athletes right. great. And that was the, really the unlock moment. That was when I went, all right, you know what? Like there's something here beyond what I thought because I'm in this world-class weight room. It's not like Stanford's, you know, facility lacks for great gear. Mm -hmm. And yet all these coaches are coming up and telling me all these ways that this thing will be great for their athletes. And so that was really the aha moment. And then I used the, you know, the summer between first and second year to prototype like improvements uh, to the system and then to go over to Hong Kong and try to find somebody who'd make these for me. Um, and I came back and used the second year as an incubator, which was a real luxury, right? To be in school, in business school with an entrepreneurial emphasis and be doing a startup. I mean, that if you can engineer that into your plan, it's, it's, it's a great one. I did not plan it that way. It just kind of happened. Uh, but it, it, was, uh, it was terrific because it allowed me to vet pretty much every element of this business with classmates who had experience in that particular domain from their okay. work experience prior to business school, right? So I was able to, to really co-opt a bunch of pro bono labor uh, <laughs> into my cause. And, you know, they all got free straps. So it wasn't completely free, but, you know, uh, <laughs> but it ended up being great. And it, it convinced me that by the end of, uh, of business school, all right, if I'm ever going to do it, man, now, now's the moment. I'm going to give it a shot and see if, uh, if I can make this thing go. Hmm. That's really cool. One of the things that uh, stands out to me is how it was all different types of teams still kind of all asking you, you know, like, what, what's, what is it about this thing? What, tell us about this, you know? So it wasn't just the football guys. So that, that, that kind of, was that, was that what the unlock moment was you said? Yeah. I mean, it, when you, if you, if you draw a line between those cohorts that I was talking about, right, 300 pound male linemen and 90 pound sprinters or <laughs> tennis players, well, like yeah. you got a pretty good cross section of humanity right there. And <laughs> while I, while, while I yeah. didn't anticipate initially, you know, that, that it would be so great for seniors uh, and people that are, you know, rehabilitative coming sure. out of surgery sure. or, or, you know, nursing an injury back to health. I did think that, all right, if this many different kinds of athletes think this thing would be great mm -hmm. for them, then, then that's a big audience, right? Plenty big mm -hmm. enough. Absolutely. Okay. That's awesome. Can you share with us uh, your big, your, your first win? Uh, was that while you were still in business school, would you say, or was that after you came out? Well, uh, you know, man, my first win, I don't know. You got to, as an entrepreneur, you got to appreciate all the little wins. Yeah. So, okay. so there were, there were little wins going all the way along. And I guess that's probably a good piece of advice. Like rather than benchmark off of some huge, milestone that may be significantly out of one's control, I really encourage people to, to, to celebrate, pay attention and celebrate all the wins, the little wins along the way and acknowledge, you know, the losses, right? Because that way, you know, people often ask the question of when to make a decision on, you know, whether to cut bait and, you know, give up on something or keep grinding. And I think that really the best way to do that is to, is to, to look at the stack of, of wins versus losses. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if, if one starts to get significantly, uh, you know, ahead of the other, then that should be an indicator in either direction. Right. If, if your wins are, are vastly out exceeding your losses, then you're onto something great. Conversely, if your losses are mounting and your wins are hard to come by, that might be an indicator that at the very least a retooling of your strategy is in order. Mm, mm. So for me, I guess to answer your question, you know, one of the early wins, uh, we used to have these things at Stanford called the liquidity preference functions, right? Uh, which, liquidity which it, preference functions. Yeah. So, okay. so the, they called them LPFs and, and really it was a, it was a play on, liquidity prefs, which are, you know, preferences in a security and a financial security. But these liquidity uh, preference functions were Friday afternoon booze fests out in the quad. And I, uh, 
and I, I brought some of my straps out there for one of our, for one of our LPFs. And while everybody now could have been because they were drunk, but you know, regardless, they, uh, they all got on the straps, you know, gave it a go. And I came away from that event with a whole bunch of, of, of my classmates that had said, Hey man, can I, you know, can I put in a pre-order? I want, I want mine as soon as you can get them. And that was, that was a moment when I was like, all right, these guys, you know, they're serious. They, they want this thing. So that's, yeah. that's good. I've got at least, you know, 20 customers. And then, uh, and then shortly thereafter, and by that, I mean, maybe a year and a half later, I went down to a trainer trade show called idea world fitness conference down in San Diego as one of the first public public airings I ever did of the straps mm. and we sold out of every single strap we had in stock. Right. Yeah. And, and I've, I've told this story plenty. The second day, it was a three day trade show. First day we sell out everything we have. Second day I'm selling paper futures, which I'm sure is quite uh -huh. illegal, but, <laughs> uh, but I didn't know it at the time. Right. And then, yeah. and then I had, I had my part-time office assistant, you know, FedEx me every strap we had left in our pathetic little warehouse uh, overnight and the third day, then I was basically able to hand out the straps to the people who had bought the paper futures the day before. And at the end of that trade show, we'd sold every single unit of stock that we had. And that Man. was another moment when I went, mm. all right, this is interesting, right? Because trainers who are paid to yeah. deliver value to their clients, these yeah. trainers think this thing's great. And they know a lot about fitness, right? So, so that's better than just a customer. That's a, a customer, an expert, and a champion all wrapped mm. up in one. And that was one of the big moments, I would say, you know, that convinced me that, all right, we're on to something. Mm. Jump into the, uh, take, a, take a turn on this interview here. We'll jump into the heart healthy hustle round. I'm going to ask you a series of rapid fire questions uh, based on the title of the show. So are you ready? I am ready. Let's do it. So for heart, what activity do you use to care for and strengthen your internal character? Oh man. Well, I, I use my suspension trainer because it tests my character every single time I'm on it. That <laughs> in the physical side, I do a lot of high intensity uh, interval stuff, which really I do believe kind of tests your fortitude. And as an aging athlete, it is a great way, you know, I can't necessarily or I shouldn't go out and hammer a marathon, right? Instead, yeah. I like to do short, high intensity bursts, whether it's pushing a sled on my straps, lifting weights or, or, uh, or on a tread, you know, pushing a, uh, a sled on the treadmill. And those things really test your character. And then I use my kids as, as the, the other test of my character, because, you know, if you can always find time and energy to be patient and honest with your kids, then I reckon that's about as good a litmus test as you can find in life. Can you give us an example? Yeah. I mean, you know, patience, I got a six-year-old and I'm working from <laughs> home right now, man. Like anybody who, anybody who has, has taken on that task understands what patience it is. And it certainly gives me uh, a lot of respect for all the moms out there that yeah. are that are doing the homeschooling, working, mm -hmm. and you know maintaining uh, the softness that a mom is required to deliver. And so, mm -hmm. you know, my six-year-old tests my patience, and I have an eighteen-year-old. And you want somebody to really test your patience? Go raise an eighteen-year-old. So, you know, both of those, both of those dudes uh, keep me on my toes and keep me honest. I love it. I love it. Um, d definitely shout out to the parents out there who are who are handling that during this time. It's been it's been a crazy time in the last couple of months. Um, so for health, you mentioned some high intensity training interval stuff. Um, for the heart, for the heart, is there anything you do like silence, solitude, sitting in the woods? Like, do you do any anything like that to kind of nurture that in, inner man, so to speak? Anything like that? Yeah, well, I probably should do more meditation. Um, and I, and I know, I know that I just haven't evolved there yet, uh, but I'm trying. And so, so one of the things that I've been doing for the last, geez, I don't know, I guess I started it not too long before this virus hit. And it's been, it's actually been kind of a godsend to me is every morning I'm starting with 30 minutes of, I'm setting my alarm a little earlier, getting up and starting with 30 minutes of reading. Mm -hmm. And it's the closest that I can come to meditation other than working out, 
right? Because my, my meditation is a workout. Yeah. I like, that's why I, you know, I do actually, I like to work out in a group for the energy of it, but I also like working out on my own for the solitude of it. Right. And yeah. I, I find meditation to be challenging. Um, my mind just runs amok, but if you put a task in front of me, right? So for instance, a book, all right, mm -hmm. well, my mind is other focused on the content. Yeah. If I'm on a concept two, you know, rower and I'm hammering out a piece, well, again, my mind is focused on, you know, the, the, uh, the, the readout in front of me and where I am. And so those serve as meditation. I think those help, you know, kind of, kind of level me out. They help, to the heart that you're speaking of a little bit of a little bit of uh, emotional solitude and uh you know time to just sort of focus on doing something that's good for me rather than you know the next task yeah yeah i can imagine i mean it sounds like your entire life has been a formula one race to be honest i mean you know kind of given <laughs> given your background so it's like what do you do to kind of make those pit stops? Have you had crashes? Have you, you know, can you share with us a, a time where you went through a pretty significant failure, whether it was your personal life, maybe anything that you, it comes to mind. I'm sure the audience would love to kind of, kind of have rapport with you in that area. Yeah. Well, I mean, Hey, uh, my life has been an endless series of micro failures, right? Each of which led to a greater success. So it's, uh, mm. you know, it's, if you're gonna, if you're going to dare greatly, right? I remember an old poem, uh, bits of it by Theodore Roosevelt, right? If you're going to dare yeah. greatly, then, then you got to accept that you are often going to fall short of your target. And, uh, you know, that's, I mean, that's happened to me over and over and over and over again throughout my life um, on every level, professional, scholastic, athletic, uh, you know, as a product developer, way more things fail than succeed. Uh, in relationships, you know, I've had more than my share of ups and downs. Uh, you know, uh, the ups mostly were due to, to uh, you know, my partners. The downs were mostly due to my own uh, missteps. And, you know, that's just the way that, that life goes. If you're going to be somebody who, who takes on uh, hard things. And, you know, I, I also want to say that I, I would say that my first, well, probably... 40 of my first 54 years on earth uh, have been defined by doing hard things. And while I think that's cool in some respects, because it, you know, it, it, it by definition means that you're going to, you're going to live an extraordinary life. Sure. Uh, I don't, I don't mean extraordinary in any trite sense. I mean, extraordinary, like out yeah. of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. um, so it's cool for that reason. Uh, I also think it can be overrated. And, and now that I'm getting a little bit of wisdom, I'm, I, I can say definitively that I want my next 54 years to be characterized by some things other than just what's hard, right? Because uh, at some point, man, the, the, the testosterone starts to wane a little bit. You also, you know, some of the inner angst that, that drove me to prove myself as a young right, man, right. I reckon I've done pretty well you mm -hmm. know, improving those things. And so at this point, I, I want to prove myself to be a smarter man in the next 54 years. Is you writing your book part of that? Yeah, sharing things you learn, right? That's why, I, that's why I'm always happy to, to support a podcast for some yet young aspirational cat like you, you know, because it's, it's, I think that the really one of the highest forms of life in any culture is to be a teacher, and it's, it's unfortunate that we pay our teachers so little relative to, you know, to our that. celebrities um, yeah. because what they do is, is absolutely essential to the evolution of not only our, our culture and our country, but to the human species. And so, you know, I, I reckon that it's, that it's the point in my life where I should start to, to focus on giving, sharing some of the things that I've learned, good, bad, and otherwise, right. So with the next generation of, uh, of folks that are going to come up and build great things and lead great organizations and raise great kids and be good teachers. That's fantastic. Well, I do appreciate you coming on for sure. The last question in the heart healthy hustle round is hustle. And the main question is uh, with this round is what's your main motivation for doing what you do? What's your, what's your why? You know, my why it's funny cause I'm, I'm rereading uh, 
uh, I'm rereading Simon Sinek's book right now, okay. Start With Why. And um, I, in fact, I just read a half hour this morning just to show there you. There you go. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I mean, my why, it's, it's maybe not uh, definable in, in one sentence, but it, it's kind of a amalgamation of, of a few things. One, I really do, I really do believe in, in, uh, in living multiple lives, Right, because you only get to go around once. So, so why just live one life? Why, why not? Why not define it a few different ways? Right, over over the course of a lifetime. Um, and so, I'm always hungry for for the next. Uh, I used to say challenge. Now I'm now I'm hungry for the next set of experiences. Right, the ability to learn new things, to master something else, or try to master it at least. Um, that's one of, of my, of my fundamental drivers. One of my whys. Another one is, you know, I'm, I, I started after a career as a seal. Uh, I started my career as a dad. So I've got two kids, right. That, that one of, one of whom is youngish and one of whom is really young. And, you know, I want to set a great example for those cats and I want to leave them with, uh, you know, something of, of value that can help support their lives, right? As they, as they go on. And then, then the third is really around my, my role as a, as an organizational founder, I want to create, you know, a great business that does great things for people all around the world, which TRX has done and which provides, you know, a really great living for my teammates who have chosen to, you know, bestow the great honor on me of sharing their professional lives with me. So, so it's sort of, you know, a little bit personal, a little bit, um, a little bit uh, familial, and then a little bit um, entrepreneurial. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Randy. Appreciate that a lot. Yeah, my, um, my, my pleasure. But it sounded like you were alluding to a lot of your life up to now has been winning, you know, winning, maybe proving yourself, winning at hard things. Now that you've done that in, you know, multiple arenas at the highest level, you know, what was the, was the arrival to that point a little anticlimactic or was it, you know, obviously it's fantastic to, to achieve that, but what, what, what was the overwhelming sense, uh, you know, what was your perspective around that? A lot of the things that I, I've sort of taken away about life, I, I learned on the trail, right? Mm -hmm. Humping a heavy ruck and yeah. And I've, because it really is a great metaphor. I mean, if you, if you haven't ever gotten out in the outback with a heavy ruck on and, and gone for, you know, a week or so to, to try to live out there, it's a great metaphor for life. And one of the things that I've discovered is this concept of summits, right? When you're, when you're down, you're starting a hike and you're looking up in the distance and you see the, the peak, right? The summit way out there. You think, ah, oh, I can just, you know, if, if I just grind, I'll, I'll get to that summit. And what you find on the way to the summit generally is a series of false summits, meaning, you know, mm -hmm. mountains are built of a set of ranges and the, the summit that you see in the distance is just the highest one, right? But what you don't realize until you get on the trail and you start going is that you reach a, a false summit, meaning it's a summit mm -hmm. that's below the summit that you had in your sights. And guess yeah. what happens after that? you go down into the next valley, right? And then you got to, then you climb again and you think, okay, well now I'm really headed to the summit. I run into another false summit. It's just a, lot, a little higher than the last one. And then guess what comes after that? Another valley. And so part of what I've learned about doing hard things is that if you're fortunate enough to achieve a hard goal, generally you either find that, you know, you weren't actually at the goal. You just were at an intermediate stage on the way to that goal, or you got there and you, and you immediately redefine a new goal that's even higher and harder. And which is, which is basically what I've, what I did. And, and, you know, I think that there's a, there's some good to that, but there's also a self-defeating nature. Eventually, if you just keep redefining goals that are mm. on the border of unachievable, what's going to happen is you're going to fail to achieve them. And then that's going to become, you know, a demotivating factor. And it's going to give you a sense of failure, right? Which I'm not a believer in failure. I, I think failure is a social construct. It's nonsense. Um, but I think that if you, if you constantly define goals that are ridiculously hard to achieve, you risk, you know, sort of 
looking at the flowers and never smelling any of them, you know, because they're always just out of your reach. And so, you know, that's why I say, I think that you need a mix of goals that are challenging, but you also need some layups that, you know, you can hit. And when you hit them, you need to celebrate them, not ignore them. Cause uh, you know, one day you look back and you'd be 54 and hopefully you look back at a whole bunch of, of points that you scored along the way, not just the three pointers that you missed. Hmm. Just kind of letting that soak in a minute. Yeah. Do you think that that, even your background and your personality type, has it been challenging for you to lean that way? Is this kind of a new development in thought that you're going through right now in your personal life? Because, you know, given your background, it seems like, you know, pretty intense guy. You love your family. But that said, I mean, you, you, you know, being an intense individual with the background that you have, I imagine people approach you with some form of uh, intimid, maybe in, a little bit of intimidation or uh, how have you navigated that as a, as somebody who's a confident guy who has achieved a lot? How do you navigate that and still connect with your team, still show up as the human version of Randy who, you know, actually really does care about his team, his family, everybody? Well, I mean, I, you know, I came from a very, um, I came from very loving parents. Um, you know, my dad was, my dad was a bit more of a hard ass, drove me hard and imbued this like crazy work ethic in me. My mom was very, um, my mom was very much more accepting and, um, you know, uh, I would say nurturing, although my dad certainly, you know, loved me and, uh, and, and took great care of me as well. So I feel very fortunate and that's probably where I get a little bit of my, you know, my, my ferocity and, you know, I'm a pretty, uh, I, I've been accused of being, you know, an emotional wimp uh, with the people that I love because I'm pretty soft that way. And, and that extends to most of my team as well. Um, I just think that, you know, you got to be realistic. I've, I've achieved a lot of hard things, but I didn't achieve them necessarily. Uh, I certainly didn't achieve them easily. And I didn't achieve everything within those careers that, that I wanted to. You know, and so even today, I mean, I, you know, TRX is a, has been an amazing achievement for my team and I, but we haven't, we haven't hit the, you know, we haven't extracted the pot of gold yet out of this venture that, that I want for not only my family, but for all my teammates, families. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, I think hopefully as you're getting older, you actually get more humble, not the opposite, because you realize a couple of things. You start to, you start to see the mix of wins and losses, you know, mm -hmm. in your scorecard. And you also, uh, you also start to, to realize that, Hey, you know, this, this ride has to be enjoyed along the yeah. way because there may not in fact be a destination, right. right? The destination may never actually arrive. So while you're on that ride, you got to enjoy it. And that means you got to take yourself a little bit less seriously. You got to, you got to try to have better perspective on the, on the, you know, the highs and the lows because rarely are things catastrophic and rarely are things, you know, perfect. It's usually you're oscillating in the middle between mm -hmm. the two. And as long as you're, as long as you're, you're above 50%, <laughs> yeah. then, then you got a winning record, right? And you got to celebrate yeah. it. That's right. That's right. Let's wrap it up. So um, we'll jump into the park bench paradigm. Uh, this is if you could go up to the younger version of Randy sitting on a park bench. Maybe he's uh, overseas somewhere. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a dark season in your life. Maybe it was in California. Anywhere you want to just get a vivid image of that. You present day with all of the wisdom that you have now, and you admittedly are still learning, but you're definitely in a different place now than you were. You can go up to him, put your arm around your own shoulder. Uh, what would you say to that version of Randy and why? Well, I, I mean, I would say some version of what I just told you a second ago. I would, I would go up to him and I would say, hey, uh, look, number one, uh, you're probably better than you think you are. So don't constantly define success by achieving the nearly impossible because mm -hmm. that's going to lead to a, 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 a very hard road, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Pick a few goals that really matter and, and go crush them. Um, and then I would also, uh, just, you know, remind my younger self, my granny gave me some of the best advice that I, that I ever had. She lived to be six months shy of her 104th birthday. Wow. And, wow. and about, about, you know, shortly after she turned 102, 
she and I were sitting waiting for a ferry one day and we were talking and she said, you know, when I look back on my life, one of the things that I, that I really realize is how few days I had, which sounds mm. ridiculous, right? Coming from a 102 year old woman. <laughs> and she said, and, and, and one of the things, one of my only regrets is that I now realize that, you know, you have so few days and any day you spent in angst was not a day well spent. Hmm. Not a day well spent. That's powerful stuff right there. Yeah. So I'd tell my younger self, you know, don't worry. Don't worry so much. Just, just enjoy the ride. Thanks, Randy. I appreciate you coming on to the show. How can we support you, uh, the audience? How can we follow up with you? Where are you most active online? Well, so if you go to trxtraining.com, first of all, mm -hmm. you can support yourself with some of the greatest training gear you'll ever find. And we have nice. a bunch of stuff that we've launched during COVID. Uh, to help people out, we have a, a, a TRX Live, which is live streaming workouts and video on demand workouts that are all free uh, for as long as we're all out here, you know, struggling to make a living with this thing. Yeah. And uh, awesome, you know, awesome service that is available to everybody for free. Uh, you can follow me at Randy Hetrick on uh, mm -hmm. Instagram and Facebook. And at TRX Training is the company that I founded and uh, still spend an inordinate amount of my hours uh, uh, caring for. Uh, yeah, just help spread the word, man. Black and yellow uh, universe is... Uh, is <laughs> What's next for you? What's getting you out of bed in the morning today? Oh, man. Well, I got several things going on. I'm trying, you know, I'm working on a new venture that's associated with TRX and I'm, uh, you'll be hearing about that soon. And I'm uh, developing some new products, uh, a couple of which are going to hit the market here in the next, the next uh, couple months. And I'm trying my best and I've actually found somebody that's, that's going to help me, uh, you know, help me get this done, but I'm, I'm trying my best to get this book written. So, yeah. uh, you know, those, those things and, 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 uh, and my home life pretty much about all I got room for on my plate. Well, Randy Hetrick, thank you so much for coming on the, on the show. I appreciate obviously your service in the past, um, and just everything you're doing and for supporting a guy like me and coming on the show. I, I really appreciate your time today. Oh man, I appreciate you and good, best of luck with, with your pod and, uh, best of luck yeah. to all your viewers with, uh, their adventures that, that they're either already on or, or yet to come. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate you, Randy. I'll be in touch uh, with Zach and let you know the publishing dates, everything like that. For sure. Let us know because we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we got a couple million rabid social fans. All right, brother. Take care. All right. Take care, Randy. Bye-bye. We just jumped on an amazing interview with the founder of TRX Suspension Training. Uh, if you are looking for some fitness uh, help during this time of COVID, go ahead over to uh, trxtraining.com, TRX Live. Just Google it, TRX Live, and get access to some of those free trainings and um, help TRX help you during this time of uh, this pandemic as we go through it. Uh, really cool guy, down to earth guy. I wasn't, um, you know, uh, just got in touch with uh, Randy and his team uh, probably this past month. And, uh, you know, like, like we were talking a little bit about rejection in this interview, um, you know, how, how you have to be resilient in entrepreneurship. Uh, and I think Randy's an amazing, uh, example of that, uh, with, with, uh, but that said, it does, it, it, it is cool to hear from his story that there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, naysayers. It, I'm sure they existed, but he chose to focus on, Hey, this is a viable product. Hey, there are teams at Stanford repeatedly, uh, of diverse backgrounds asking about these things, wanting to order them before he even had them being manufactured on a mass scale. And uh, then he executed with conviction, executed uh, with excitement and with uh, pretty much, I'm sure, all his energy. And he was still being willing to adjust along the way, uh, build a team. And uh, it's an amazing story of entrepreneurship and grit and really achieving pretty much what many would call the American dream. So appreciate Randy Hetrick coming on the show today. Uh, to be honest, a pretty much a dream guest of the show. Uh, I believe I reached out, <clears throat> I think I reached out to uh, Randy's team over a year ago, maybe a couple different times, um, but the uh, things aligned at the right way, in the right ways this time around, and we got a, a great, great conversation there, and uh, really cool guy, really cool to sit down and talk and learn from him and his experiences, and I uh, hope you as the listener and uh, viewer of this YouTube video got some good out of it. If you did, do me a huge favor. I'd really appreciate it. Hit that like button down below. Uh, if I fail to ask a question that you had for Randy, comment it down below 
I almost guarantee you, uh, he'll probably be very likely to be willing to answer that uh, if we pass it along to him. So if you have an, a question for him, let me know down below in the comments uh, and we'll be happy to get that passed on. Also hit the like button and the subscribe button so you can get some more amazing interviews like this. Uh, these are world-class guests, guys. I hope you are appreciating uh, the interviews and let me know as well how I can improve as the interviewer, uh, of the, as the host of the show. What are some things that you think would be great ideas to improve the show? Because without you, this show doesn't exist, I always say. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a cool journey that we're on. I appreciate you guys listening. And as always, live wide open and Godspeed.